very early. Good afternoon for those of you who are in Europe, Russia, or, or further away. Welcome to the Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies at GW. My name is Marlene Lauel. I'm the director. And it's my great pleasure to have you here with us today for this event devoted to the lunch in English of the translation of Russian archives on the Vlasov case. As you may know, in 2015, the Federal Archival Agency of Russia and the Russian State Archive Political History released three volumes of archives documenting the infamous Vlasov case, the main intents of Soviet collaborationism with Nazi Germany. And with the help of our institute, we have been able to release two volumes of translated documents, which draw on the archives of Russia, Belarus, Germany, Germany and the US. And it's the first time the English speaking audience will be able to access this important document on that question. I invite you to look at our uh, uh, website. I will be sending the link to the website in the chat where you, you can see some uh, presentation of the Vlasov archive with some original documents there. And there is also a link. The, the English version was published by our German uh, uh, um, friends uh, publisher, Ibn Verlag. So we have to discuss that today. We have six speakers, and I thank everybody for being here today with very different time zone. We are going from Seattle to Australia with Europe and with Washington, Europe and, and Moscow in the middle. We will first have our three uh, speakers from um, the Russian archives who will be giving us a general introduction, presenting the documents, the archives, and then giving us the Russian interpretation. And then we will have three uh, scholars working on this different question or different aspect of Soviet collaborationism with Nazi Germany, who will be discussing the Vlasov case, both specifically and more broadly, this issue of, of collaborationism and how scholarship is evolving in uh, interpreting it and, and discussing the documents. So our first speaker, and I hope he will be able to join us, should be Andrei Sorokin, the scientific supervisor and former director of the Russian State Archive of Social and Political History, also vice president of the Russian Political Science Association, and a member of the commission under the president of the Russian Federation for the Rehabilitation of Political Repression. Mr. Sorokin is a very famous historian who has been working especially on the period under Stalin and was one of the main, main editor of the Russian version of the book General Vlasov, History of a Betrayal. We will have also with us, we have with us uh, today Tatiana Tsarevskaya Diakina, who is the chief specialist at the Russian State Archives and who has been also working on a lot of different archive uh, documents from Stalin Gulag, Soviet military administration, Ukrainian nationalist organization, and who was also a key uh, uh, editor of the Vlasov volume. And then we will have Mr. Uh, Sergei Kudryashov, who has been a scientific researcher at the German Historical Institute in Moscow. And before that, he was chief editor of the Russian archival journal Istochnik, and uh, also working on different aspects of the Second World War, including a monograph called Occupy Economies, an economic history of Nazi-occupied Europe. And then, as I said, I will give the floor for a, a more of a discussion to our three uh, uh, colleagues. First, we will have Michael David Fox, professor at the School of Foreign Service and Department of History at Georgetown Hist uh, University, also the founding and executive director of the famous uh, journal Critica. Uh, Michael has been working on several uh, important issues related to what we will be discussing uh, today, especially now completing a, bo a book entitled Crucible of Power, Smolensk under Nazi and Soviet uh, uh, rule. Then we will have Benjamin Tromley from the University of Puget Sound, who has been publishing last year a book called Cold War Exiles, Plotting to Free Russia, that tells the story of anti-communist Russian exiles who sought to undermine Soviet Union uh, from abroad with the support of the US government. And then we will have Oleg Bieda, Beida, who completed his PhD history at the University of New South Wales in Canberra in Australia last year. And his PhD was about white Russian emigre who found on the German side during the Second World War. And it has been publishing several articles on this question. So as you see, it's really a great team and I'm really thanking everybody for being here uh, uh, today. I'm not sure 
we have been able to solve the issue with uh, uh, Andre. Is there a way Andre could speak on the phone, Matt? If not, I will give the floor to Tatiana. I've unmuted Andre. Let's see if he can hear. Andre, it. can you hear us and speak yeah. to us? Yeah. And what about you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for being here. And we apologize for this technical issue. So, Andre, we give you the floor. OK, great. Thank you. I'm glad to welcome all participants uh, of this seminar. I will allow myself to begin my reflections uh, with a statement of this to all. The great patriotic war lies at the heart of the Russian historical consciousness. At the same time, the events of the World War II, of which it is a part, still cause public debate. The wars of memory broke out on the international arena and culminated before the 75th anniversary of the end of the world. The intensity of uh, confrontation was brought to a new level by the political resolution of the European Parliament in 2019 on the results uh, of the World War II. According to this resolution, the USSR along with the Nazi Germany was declared the main culprit of its beginning. The Russian Federation recognizing itself as the legal successor of the USSR embarked on the path of political opposition to such interpretations. On June 19, President Putin presented his view of the events in the article 75 years of the great victory shared responsibility to history and the future. In this connection, I consider it important to pay attention to the fact that since the beginning of the 90s of the 20th century, a so-called archival revolution is taking place in Russia, being hardly noticeable for politicians. Millions of archival documents have been declassified and put into public circulation, including those of the war. They are published within the framework of internet projects implemented by the Russian Federal Archives and are represented during historical and documentary public exhibitions. Federal Archival Agency or Russia website called the document of the Soviet era contains a digitized Stalin's personal archive, which includes orders of Narcom of our own Ministry of Defense, a set of documents of GECAO, State Defense Committee, the highest emergency state administration board, the Soviet Narcom, the USSR government decisions, in 1945, uh, 1945. It was mentioning that the Stalin Digital Archive, which we created in cooperation with Yale University Press, is also available in the USA. The published documents cover all decisions of the Soviet leadership, including the most dramatic ones. Over the next few years, the Federal Archives will finish digitizing and post complete uh, inventories of their archival uh, collections on the internet. The interested user will be able to find references to archival files covering the wide variety of the page of the World War II history. In recent years, Federal Archival Agency of Russia uh, has held exhibitions and implemented internet projects Munich 1938 and uh, the 1939 from pacifying to the war. Diplomatic documents presented here unveil a relatively complete picture of the events of 1939-1938-1939 that led to the outbreak of the World War II. Currently, an internet project and a historical documentary exhibition, the World War II and archival documents, 
1939-1941 are being prepared. The collaboration that took place in all Nazi-occupied European countries, including the USSR, belongs to the difficult pages of the Second World War. Russian archivists have published three multi-volume editions of documents over the past, over the past decade. First, a, tom, a two volume edition, Ukrainian nationalist organizations during the Second World War was published. Then, General Velasov, a history of betrayal in three volume appeared. And from nationalism to collaborationism, Baltics during the World War II in two volumes uh, in 2018 went to public. This year, an internet project, Crimes of the Nazis, and their uh, accomplices uh, against the USSR civilian population during the Great Patriotic War was launched. The achievements of Russian archivists and of our foreign colleagues uh, create, to my mind, the basis for a serious conversation about the history of the World War II based on archival documents rather than arbitrary politicized interpretations. We must get discussions about the historical past back from the plane of political confrontation to the way of scientific and cultural discourse, and therefore to the way of dialogue and joint search for the truth. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Abedin Publishing House for publishing the Vlasov case in English language and uh, Marlene you for your efforts and uh, for organizing in this round table. Let's hope that uh, someday it will be possible to publish uh, and present and discuss other documentary collections on the history of collaborationism and other difficult pages of the World War II history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrei, for your uh, presentation. I now would like to give the floor to Tatiana to tell us a little bit more about the documents themselves. I am also very glad to take part in this presentation because of it is some book which I have made for many years, and it, it, it I found it themselves very interesting and very important. <clears throat> the compiles of the collection of documents about General Vlasov and the history of Russian collaborationism were initially given a very difficult task. The documents included the, uh, the edition were supported to reflect the origins and the native of the Russian Vlasov movement, the most large-scale collaborationist movement in the USSR during the Second World War. It should be understood that the Russian Liberation Army did not exist as an independent entity until late 1944. There were only separate so-called Russian battalions, squadrons, under the command of German army officers that were part of the volunteer units of the land forces of Wehrmacht. It was the, this squadron that we referred as RLA. RLA became a real functional army only with the creation of the Committee of Liberation of Nations of uh, Russia and its armed forces. However, the KLNR archives is not considered to have been, is now considered to have been lost. It has been noticed by Mikhail Shartov, one of of the RLR officer who collected and published RLR works in the 1960s. That is, that is why the compiles had to refer the his, to the historical document stores in the archival depositories of Russia, Belarus, Germany, and in the United States to create a complete picture of the Vlasov movement. In general, they studied more than 60 archival fans and collections in 14 archives. Then selection of the documents for publication, the main aim was to include the documents 
reflecting the real events from the four points of view. That of the Soviet government fighting against Nazi Germany, that of the Soviet people fighting on the side of enemy, the very point of Russian emigrants in Europe, and that of the Third Reich, for whom Lasser and his supporters were only subhuman. A separate point must be made about such a any unique um, source of information as the archival material, materials of the investigation case of Lasser and his supporters stored in the central archive of the Federal Security Service of Russia. All in all, more than 2,000 documents were revealed. Not all of them were included even in the Russian version of uh, the series of three books. And it was possible to use a bit uh, more, only a bit more than 100 documents for the English language publication. The documents uh, included uh, in the English edition reflect the tragedy of the Second Shock Army and the captivity of Lasser. In his article, the Soviet have not offended me in any way, Vlasen mentioned he was kept in a fire with weapon in his hand. However, the report of Sonderfuhrer Pilhau shows a, completely, shows a completely different picture of the general's surrender. He faced the Germans in the plain soldier's shirt without insignia, threw his hand up and said, Hold your fire, I am General Blas. And at the moment, at that moment, the Supreme 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 Command uh, headquarters ordered Leningrad headquarters of the partisan movement to find Vlasov and to prepare to transport him off the front line by plane. But at this point, as can be seen from the uh, from the Vlasov interrogation protocols, the general was already willingly communicating with the German officers given characteristic of the Pope's defense capability and the, of the economic capability of the USSR. In a short time after the Vlasov and the Victor Malishin, while Elergele in Smolensk wrote an appeal from the Russian comi committee to the entire Russian people with an appeal of joining the fight against Bolshevism in the sight of Nazi Germany. Also, they did not travel further than Berlin. The documents of the German archives prove that all the activities of Lasse from the end of 1942 were carried out under the direction of the military or foreign minister of the foreign affairs of Germany and was controlled by Rosenberg. The project was called Action Lasse and was considered by the military and civil authorities of Germany as a pure propaganda event. In 1943, the Germans were not planning to create any real uh, Russian liberation army. However, it was not that Vlasov expected. And when they started taking him from one garnison to another in Pskov, Vitek, Smogilov, he tried to prove the possibility of creation of anti-Bolshevik Russian army. But, uh, it, uh, uh, that did not uh, suit the interests of his bosses. And he was quickly taken back to Germany where he had nothing, almost nothing to do. According to Vlasov's own word, they will always treat me like a, uh, like a subhuman. For example, I have only one set of underwear. Also, I am supported to be the head of the so-called Russian Liberation Army. My underpants are completely worn out. At the time, part of the so-called Russian Liberation Army in the occupied territory of Soviet Union started going over to the partisans more and more. The documents of the central quarters of partisan movement contain the information of the transition, not only several soldiers, but also all military units. From, uh, to partisans. As a result, the German command took the decision to send Russian battalions to Western Front in France, where they later fought against the Allied army 
and to Italy to find again the partisans. Of great interest is quite a vast group of documents on the unsuccessful attempt to eliminate poison the kidnap, kidnap blossom. The head of the Third Reich decided to use the Russian general one more time in August, September 1944. The question was taken up by Himmler, the head of Schutzstaffel. His meeting with Blasov that provided the creation of um, LNR took place in, on 8th, 18th of September 1944. In January 1945, the German government even granted Blasov a loan to fight Bolshevism. Blasov was trying to join all the, all the anti-Soviet forces under the age of the KLNR, but as shown in the document, not all of the nationalist immigrant organization were willing to commit themselves to such unification. By decision of him, the two divisions- can you, can you shorten, yeah, not to speak too long, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I just want uh, to explain that these two divisions, they fight, uh, fight against the uh, Red Army only once, near Furstenwalde. And then the um, General Gunyachenko, dissolving the order of the German generals, led the division, division south in a hope of uh, surrendering to American troops. Uh, also, in the last moment, when the last part of history of this first uh, um, division of RLA is the moment when they transi uh, transition uh, to the chief, the chief insurgent in Prague. Vlasov uh, tried it to uh, surrender to the Americans, but he was, caught, he was caught in the 12th of uh, um, uh, May in, um, by a um, uh, Soviet tank troop from Ukrainian from. The, uh, yeah, I just want to say about second volume, where we published the documents from Vlasov archival investigation files. Um, in the uh, Russian edition, included all the inter uh, interrogation protocols of Vlasov and his 11 uh, supporter. But in the English language edition, we have to find the most interest interest protocols, the war, uh, most interest protocols. The protocols uh, uh, reflect the collaboration of Lasov and his accomplices with uh, Schutzstaffeln and, and the German military and intelligence units, as well as their participants on the various immigrants' parts and units. And their um, testaments of Lasov supporter and accomplices also explain why they decided to go to the enemy. Here we can see the spectrum of human relations and attitudes from people like Truhin and myself, who truly hated the Soviet system, to Zakutny, who deserved because of the offended vanity. Lasson and his 11 uh, supporters uh, judged in a close court all participants in the trial, the sentence to the hanging, and, and uh, this, this night they were hanged in the prison yard. The um, compiler's thought that, uh, that this document edition about Vlasov movement will arouse interest of researchers. Yeah. Thank you very much <laughs> for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tatiana, for presenting all these fascinating documents. I now would like to give the floor to Sergei for presenting the, the Russian interpretation, and then after we will move to our three discussants. Sergey, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, when we here in Moscow uh, were preparing a book about Vlasov, I was given the task to write an introduction. Uh, eventually, I've done that in cooperation with the current head of the Russian Archival Service, Mr. Artizov, I think he's a professor as well and doctor, but it was not that easy. 
uh, we had to deal with the various uh, trends and in modern historiography, uh, trying to pay particular attention to the best studies. At the same time, uh, a big dilemma for both of us uh, was how to deal with non-academic, or to put it straight, with obscure interpretations of loss of movement, of the loss of movement. For instance, uh, former uh, leader leader of uh, uh, Perestroika and the first mayor of Moscow under Yeltsin government, Gavriil Popov, claimed in his book about Vlasov uh, that Vlasov, in fact, was a sort of an ideological founder of Perestroika in the Soviet Union, that his ideas inspired liberal Russian movement under Gorbachev. His counterpart, one more illustration, General Filatov, uh, a former uh, military uh, historian and former editor of, uh, of the official military uh, historical journal, claimed in his book uh, that lots of men were, in fact, well-trained spies, Soviet spies. Allegedly, uh, those soldiers deliberately went into German captivity to undermine Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht troops internally, within. Uh, uh, so I remember our debates, how far we should go in deliberating uh, with such views. And finally, we decided to mention those publications but refrain from any uh, detailed polemics with them. In the meantime, uh, we, we had to deal with a new trend in Russian historiography, uh, which is uh, represented by a relatively small but active group of people. Uh, they, they regard Vlasov to be a war hero, a noble man, who tried to fight against Bolshevism, but perished in that unequal battle. So one can easily find a, a bunch of books uh, with similar views in, in all major historiographies, and the American one is not an exception. Uh, but I think that both Russian and the current American edition uh, of most important documents about the loss of, uh, if not demolishes, but uh, rather persuasively uh, deconstructs uh, those uh, pro loss of views. Uh, I belong to that group of, of historians who believe that the more we study the loss of and similar people, we come to the conclusion that Vlasov was a part of a more general phenomenon, we call it collaboration, and uh, if we compare him with other supporters of Hitler, I, I think he was very similar to them. Uh, yes, there was a certain Russian flavor, or a Russian slant, if you like, but that was it. Um, well, one more point to be stressed, uh, since uh, people who would like to read uh, an American edition, if they want to compare um, uh, documents translated into English with the Russian ones, it's good to know that the entire Russian publication is available online. So you can even download it from the site of the Russian archives. So that's good for the scholars. And uh, mm, one more point, uh, when we were preparing uh, those three volumes, uh, we, we definitely had more documents than we could publish. And uh, a, 
a reasonable question which is always asked uh, uh, did you did you have any particular documents you didn't want to publish was 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 there a lot of uh, secret documents are there still a lot of secret documents and so uh, and and similar questions so um i think when we were preparing those three russian volumes uh there was a general agreement among editors that there was nothing secret to us and there was no particular sensitive or, or um, any I don't, I don't know dangerous document which which we didn't want to publish so we we freely collected uh, most important ones are there still any secret documents yes there are some uh, but I don't think there any deliberate attitudes from the Russian government or Russian archival uh, services to keep them secret. The point is that it is a very lengthy procedure of, declassif of declassification in Russia. It takes a lot of time, and I don't, I don't see that any politics is involved. Well, that's briefly it, and I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you so much, Sergei, for these very important points. I now would like to uh, open the floor to our three discussants and give them the opportunity to both discuss the archive, but also the general topic of collaboration and presenting also their own perspective on that. We will begin with Michael. Michael, can I give you the floor first? Yes, thank you. And I just want to say I have a couple of slides and I don't I'm not sure I can I think I can share my screen when the time comes, but we'll see if that works. But I want to say a few words. First of all, I'm glad to see my colleagues here and this is a very um, good discussion so far. I want to say a few words about Russian collaboration. Well, collaboration on Russia, the territories of today's Russian Federation on the Eastern Front. Uh, of World War II, and I want to say a few words about two types of collaboration, military collaboration and civilian or, well, military involving defectors and all those Soviets who sought, fought on the, the German side, and a civilian political collaboration of those who staffed the local governances or Ukrave on the German-occupied territories. As you mentioned, my own researches on Smolensk Oblast. Both types of collaboration involve high-level figures, um, such as military officers, uh, one of the first major units to defect Ivan Kornanov and the Kornanovs who fought in almost all the major anti-partisan battles or other high-level figures. Uh, and on the civilian side, those intelligentsia and professional figures who were favored by the Germans and recruited to staff the local governance's administrations. And they also both type, types of collaboration involve uh, ordinary rank and file, men such as ex-POWs and local policemen. I just want to say a, a one word about collaboration in historical and or maybe say versus political uh, approaches to collaboration. Uh, if you immerse yourself in the pan-European scholarly literature on collaboration, I think it's something of a truism that black and white shade into shades of gray uh, and moral judgments are sometimes clouded when looking at the entire spectrum of collaboration because mixing with ideological and political factors and often superseding them are coercion, uh, survival strategies, hunger, and many situational uh, factors, not to mention side switching, which was already mentioned uh, by Tatiana. The great encirclements at the beginning of the war between say Barbarossa and the Battle of Moscow uh, created huge numbers of Soviet POWs, Shocking numbers of these uh, died in horrific, horrific, I would say, quasi-genocidal uh, starvation conditions in the German POW camps. Um, the estimates are up to over 3 million uh, Soviet POWs in the course of the entire war who died on German hands or in German camps. 
choosing to fight for the Germans often uh, meant uh, avoiding death. The chaos after the invasion, uh, in no small part caused by the decision to Stalin's decisions to discount advanced intelligence and also the orders never to retreat created a burning anger among long columns of POWs who were, had been exposed for a long many years to Soviet propaganda about the invincibility of their borders. And I've seen a lot of firsthand documents about this. The sheer scale of ex-Soviet fighters on the German side in general was crucial for the anti-partisan war, for administration of this vast occupied territory, but also for the German war effort itself. At Stalingrad, as many as one in 10 prisoners taken by the Soviets were former Red Army men. By September 43, the overall number of Soviet citizens in German uniform was probably between about 800,000 to a million. And overall, it rose to 1.6 million if you include auxiliaries serving in the police, army, and SS. Most came from the RSFSR, 51%, followed by the Caucasus, 18%, Ukraine, 16%, and the Baltics, 12%. So um, a significant scholarly work on military collaboration is Mark Edelay's 2017 Oxford University Press book called Stalin's Defectors. And it's because it's based not only on emigre and Russian language, Soviet archival sources, but on the German interrogation records. And Edelay emphasizes the complexity of motivations. Dissatisfaction with Stalinism was widespread, but, quote, few desired to fight on the side of the enemy. Many were motivated either by defeatism or desire to survive whatever happened. Collaborators driven by anti-Stalinism appear in his book to be, quote, a substantive minority of fairly ordinary Soviet citizens from all social groups. And the findings of that book support the interpretation that, quote, the majority understood their own interests in opposition to both Hitler's and Stalin's regime. Among military defectors, Adelaide found, quote, one widespread expression of anti-Stalinism was Russian nationalism combined with anti-Semitism. So among, um, in the ethnically Russian Wehrmacht administrator, administered areas such as Smolensk, where unlike Ukraine, there was no indigenous pre-existing nationalist movement. There was quite a bit of talk in 1942 and 1943 among local collaborationist Russian figures, returned NTS, anti-Soviet emigre nationalists um, who worked in these governances, even in the Russian language press about some sort of national Russian autonomous future within the German Reich. This history of nationalist sentiment in the occupied territories is a complicated story with many inchoate tendencies that sort of never cohered. Uh, I can't go into it, but there were many voices also within the Nazi polycratic state, the Reich, who realized the potentialities or the necessity in terms of a long-term occupation for making certain concessions to Russian national sent sentiment. But all of these foundered and failed on the fundamental unwillingness of Hitler to make any exceptions other than propagandistic ones. And hence the importance of Vlasov and his movement, as has already been mentioned, for German propaganda in 1942, 1943. As the documents in this book show, um, in the German calculation, this was, there are documents that say explicitly, this is to counter the increasingly explicit elements of Russian nationalism in Soviet wartime propaganda. Now, if I can share my screen here, um, let's see, I will. I just wanna show you uh, two slides here. Okay. Um, and this is, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes that I have left to speak about the case of Boris Menshagen who was the collaborationist mayor burgomister of Smolensk from 1941-43. No other Russian mayor of a major Russian town under German occupation produced memoirs of such significance. He was arrested by Smirsch in 45 in Prague, 
sentenced to 25 years in prison, 10 of them in isolation. The reason he was not executed was that he had witnessed the German exhumation of mass graves in Katyn, an NKVD execution site in near Smolensk, where uh, Polish officers were massacred in 1940. At Nuremberg, the Soviets tried to blame the crime on the Germans, and Menshagen's deputy mayor, uh, Basilevsky, uh, testified to that effect and ended up living his life teaching astronomy in Novosibirsk. Menshagen refused to testify, but he was kept alive in any case, and he wrote his memoirs, which um, were quite selective, but are nonetheless a very important source. Um, and I was involved for years in this 900-page documentary publication. I have my own chapter in here. Menshagen was never anti-Semitic. He was religious. He was enthusi had been, in 1936, enthusiastic about the Stalin constitution, but then was disillusioned by the terror. In Smolensk and in the war, he was one step removed from the Nazi wartime atrocities that he was later blamed for, implicated. He did not directly command the local police or security police that helped liquidate the ghetto, fight the partisans. And in fact, his signature allowed numerous starving POWs to be released and registered in the city administration jobs, which was allowed by the Germans, by the way. Menshagen was more a technocrat than an ideologue, but in all matters, great and small, he outwardly subordinated himself to the German military authorities. Menshagen signed the so-called Smolensk Declaration uh, by, written by Vlasov in December 42. This photograph is likely that occasion. This is late 1942, and he, Menshagen is sitting at the desk. What's interesting to me is that Menshagen was a well-known defense attorney during, in Smolensk during the Great Terror of the late 1930s. And there's a certain logic to Menshagen's life and role across the 1941 divide. As a defense attorney in 37, he stuck his neck out in a highly unusual way. He succeeded in getting a few acquittals in the show trials. Both during the terror and under the German occupation, Menshagen maneuvered within the system. And in both cases, he succeeded because he held a position of local prominence that also required the technical skills that he possessed. Now, Menshagen justified in his memoirs serving Berlin in precisely the same moralistic terms he justified serving during Stalin's terror, pointing out that he had maneuvered to save some of the victims. Now, as I mentioned, in all matters of security, ideology, and supplying the Wehrmacht, the Germans were in charge in occupied Smolensk. But within those parameters, as head of the city governance, Uprava, Menshagen was able to provide jobs, housing, and access to canteens in the near starving city for approximately one tenth of its population who worked either for his administration or one of its enterprises. So in subordinating himself to the Nazis, he rendered himself powerless to the point of abasement, but in so doing, he acquired greater local power. So that's what I have to say here. If I can get out of this uh, screen, I will. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for presenting that really fascinating case. I now would like to give the floor to Benjamin. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to take part in this uh, event today, which is uh, extremely interesting. And um, uh, serendipitously, uh, I just finished a review essay uh, for Russian Review. Uh, which is pre reviewing uh, the English version of these documents, um, along with a few other works on collaboration and Vlasov. So uh, that's going to be the basis of what I'm speaking about today. And in particular, I want to talk in more detail about the historiography of uh, Vlasov Vlasovism, how it was shaped by the Cold War in particular. Uh, and I just want to begin by uh, thanking the uh, the uh, archivists and historians who put together this volume, as well as the translation. This is a remarkable collection of sources. Um, but of course, sources never speak for themselves. Uh, uh, it takes historians and readers to give them shape. Uh, and therefore, the question 
for me is what do these new documents, as well as other research that's being done in the field, uh, suggest in terms of uh, the historiography and potentially new approaches to thinking about collaboration. Uh, so I, what I want to convey is that uh, Vlasov, and this connects very well to, I think, what Sergei was saying in this regard, uh, this is an incredibly bifurcated literature. Uh, often the literature presents a kind of uh, 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 binary opposition. Uh, was Vlasov a hero or uh, a traitor? Um, and in the West, I think it is safe to say there has been the, the, the heroic narrative has been dominant. Uh, one can point to a series of uh, kind of assumptions that have been made about uh, the uh, Vlasov movement and its various phases during the war. Uh, that it was, in fact, a movement uh, is an important uh, assumption. Uh, that uh, that Vlasovism had a democratic basis. Uh, that it was anti-Nazi. Uh, and that it was at least potentially a popular uh, movement. Um, and uh, this literature one can see in, in the, the leading study in English for, by Catherine and Veyev in the 1980s. Uh, one can see this in the in the important by Hoffman uh, in the German uh, in the German historiography. Uh, and I would argue that this narrative is uh, fundamentally flawed. Uh, and uh, I try to use in this review evidence from the Vlasov case volumes uh, and other sources uh, to kind of uh, reject the core claims of this literature. And I, I'll just very briefly go over that because we've heard from Tatiana and others about the specific details of this case. But uh, just briefly, uh, the problems with this narrative uh, in, a, in a broader sense. Uh, first of all, I think it's problematic to call the Vlasov movement a movement. Uh, it's very hard to establish what uh, people uh, like Vlasov thought about the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Uh, one could argue it's virtually impossible. Uh, and in this regard, I think it's important to, uh, uh, to, to, to get back to Michael's point about, uh, you know, that to a large extent, uh, collaboration was caused uh, by the conditions of captivity, the conditions of war uh, that was faced, in particular the horrific experiences uh, that, uh, that prevailed in the prisoner of war camps. Um, and there's some evidence, I believe, for, for some of the Vlasov figures that this context was really decisive. Uh, escaping the horrific conditions in these camps was very important in determining um, determination uh, or determining the course of collaboration. And I would mention that in this regard, I think this is a potential weakness of the interrogation records published in the Vlasov case, because often uh, the, the Vlasov figures uh, uh, who are being tried talk about their ideological opposition to Stalinism, and I don't. I, I think the, the the interrogations give the facts very well, but whether they necessarily describe the motivations of these Vlasov leaders, I think is 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 not entirely clear. Uh, was the Vlasov movement democratically minded? To take another assumption, I think this is a, a very problematic assumption. There's an excellent work by Matthias Schroeder in in German uh, that. Uh, that that shows that the SS carefully guided uh, the the uh, the propaganda efforts of the Committee for the Liberation of, the of Russia, um, and perhaps as a kind of creating a democratic veneer for this movement uh, in the Nazi attempt to, to split the Allies at the end of the war. Uh, moving on, the anti-Nazi supposedly uh, credentials of the Vlasov movement. Um, one sees this uh, narr narrative a great deal, and I think this is also flawed. It relies on a kind of simplistic understanding of uh, Vlasov's uh, German backers who were supposedly, um, you know, sympathetic to the uh, Russian national cause, um, usually seen as kind of the Wehrmacht patrons. Um, and it, but uh, but I think this is a this is a flawed assumption as well, as one can see through uh, the kind of manipulation of Vlasov and the other leaders in the course of the war. Uh, and then finally, this issue of mass support um, uh, to a point already mentioned by Tatiana that there was a, a once Soviet victory can be seen in 1943. Discipline and morale problems really spiral within the uh, uh, various Eastern troops connected to uh, Vlasov and all the Eastern troops, I should say. Um, so why is such a 
inaccurate, I think, narrative uh, been so persistent in the literature in the West. And I think here one has to understand Cold War realities. One has to see this literature as a product of several forces. First of all, the writings of Russian emigres um, who wrote their own history after World War II as part of an effort to continue their struggle uh, against the Soviet Union as part of the Cold War. Uh, Vlasov was indeed a kind of hegemonic figure for the so-called second wave of the, of the emigration, although sometimes Vlasov could be interpreted different ways within that immigration. Um, so uh, uh, this was, of course, in part an, an American story, as I talk about in, in, in my book, Cold War Exiles and the CIA. Uh, for some American cold warriors, uh, Vlasov became a, a lesson in how to fight, how to conduct political warfare against the Soviet state. Uh, and this narrative that Vlasov could have challenged Stalin if only the Germans had supported him uh, fit exactly into this framework. Uh, but this is also a German context. Uh, after World War II, German veterans and commentators um, saw in German support of the Vlasov episode a form of national and even personal kind of exoneration for uh, their deeds on the Eastern Front. Uh, this narrative, of course, then passed into Russia itself after the collapse of the Soviet system. And the kind of ideological heter heter heterogeneity of the 1990s. Um, where you have the 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 uh, Popov, who was already mentioned, and others talk about Vlasov as kind of a pre precursor for uh, post-Soviet democracy. Uh, so I think this is a limited, a very limited literature on the Western side. Of course, on the for the, uh, the 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 Soviet and Russian side, one has I think a much clearer narrative of uh, betrayal. Um, and of course, that was whatever was written in the Soviet Union presented Vlasov and others as unprincipled uh, traitors. Uh, and this narrative continues on uh, to this day during what Mark Edel has called the his history wars over the meaning of uh, World War II in the past decades. Um, and and I, I, I think, as uh, Sergei has already mentioned, that's the I, I think this this continues right into the introduction uh, to the volumes under discussion today, which offers a fairly comprehensive condemnation of uh, immigre and Western historiography on uh, Vlasovism. Um, uh, I, I would argue that uh, that while it's 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 important to to uh, to uh, uh, the the way in which this introduction presents Vlasov in terms of in comparison with other collaborators, uh, simple moral condemnation uh, does little to help historians understand the action of collaborators, uh, and particularly nationalist collaborators such such as such as Vlasov, of which there were many in Europe who thought they could use the Hitler state for their own purposes, but ended up making uh, horrific compromises uh, with, with uh, Nazism. Uh, in recent uh, years, the, there's a very lively uh, Russian historiography um, on uh, Vlasov, which I, I can't discuss, discuss at length, but I should just mention some of the, the, the names. Um, uh, Ivan Kaftun, uh, Dmitry Zhukov, Andrei Martinov uh, and Alek Beda, who's here, Igor Petrov and others, uh, who I think are offering uh, a very critical uh, uh, take on Vlasovism, but one that's slightly uh, less sweeping uh, than that which has been dominated in Russia in the past. Um, and it particularly uh, this literature, I should point out, has made, I think, really important um, contributions in terms of seeing the connection of Vlasovism to Nazi ideological goals on the Eastern Front, including by some of the high-ranking uh, officers in Vasov's uh, forces. Uh, so nevertheless, I wanna end my comments just by suggesting that there is still a need for new work on the Vlasov project. Um, I think there's a need to overcome the national dialectic of condemnation and betrayal, which has dominated this literature. Uh, a few possible directions, I think one, uh, is to emphasize uh, the complex and sometimes unintended linkages between intentions, forms, and outcomes in collaboration. Uh, and we have to remember that many of the Nazi projects involving uh, Russians derive from the willingness of Wehrmacht officers and other Germans on the Eastern Front to undertake experiments with sometimes little or no confirmation uh, from Berlin. Um, so, in a wider sense, I think the, the, the Vlasov action was actually a very complicated uh, enterprise, which involved many different forces, uh, the uh, cynical maneuver, maneuvers of propagandists, um, bureaucratic clashes over Ostpolitik and the Hitler state, 
uh, various aspirations of uh, displaced or desperate uh, citizens, um, and all of this against the backdrop of a horrific and murderous occupation regime. Um, so that's one def one th direction I think is to see uh, complexity, and I believe seeing that complexity in an analytical terms would bring up new kinds of questions that haven't been addressed at all uh, or very minimally to date. Uh, and the second uh, uh, direction for future research that I, that I want to undertake myself in particular is to trace this uh, fascinating literature and the place of Vlasov in memory. Um, as I've tried to argue, commentators and scholars on both sides of the debate have drawn on the legacy of the Cold War. Uh, whether that legacy is of, is of Soviet, Russian emigre, or German or American origin. Uh, therefore, one hopes that uh, in the future we can move towards an intellectual deconstruction of the various uh, competing class of myths. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for this analysis. And I now would like to give the floor to Oleg. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to keep it uh, nice and short. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank Marlene and the GWEU for having us and for hosting such a presentation. Well, it's a rare occasion, the topic of collaborations for a public event. Here exists an interesting um, discrepancy. No one likes the topic itself, yet in the last 15 years, the demand for it and the interest towards life under Germans has grown in space. Well, we can dial it back to the Russian mid-2000s when I was only cutting my teeth developing axis and the sole thing one constantly heard was why would anyone study this well indeed why although the second world war has grown smaller and smaller in the rear view mirrors of our lives it, it continues to loom large in our mental dimension at 70 years distance uh, we're in a sweet spot where the events are far away hazy enough not to create a violent uproar and yet tangible enough to be interpreted as the immediate family's history Given the latter factor, Glowen Hot is the forge of contemporary politics. The war is used as a means of attaining political legitimacy. The war's dark underbelly, which is collaboration, is a mighty trump card, the type of ammo utilized to shoot opponents down in ongoing memory wars. Um, in purely academic sense, a sober outlook on the sort of topic is evidently emerging. Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Spain, Spain, the list goes on, really. These are the countries where new trailblazing studies were published in the last eight to 10 years, the image of local Wehrmacht and SS auxiliaries in Europe is undergoing rapid change, and it's a welcome change too. In this regard, the current publication of Vlasov and his crew is part and parcel of a larger academic process. Uh, well, having said that, we should not rush to claim that these two tomes or three tomes immediately eclipse the complexity of the Soviet collaboration or effectively exhaust the topic. Turning sides, Vlasov became but a facet of the enormous process he did not control. A tough fate befell an astonishing number of Soviet people that were either pushed to step under the German banner to survive or chose to do so on their own accord. Hence, the Soviet case of collaboration was a much more multi-layered and uh, enveloped process than we think. The field of studies, this cooperation with the enemy is replete with countless lagoons. Suffice it to say that Alexander Dallin's work still reads fresh, despite it being published in 1958. To make things even worse, the process of academic reconstruction of the topic is hampered by two factors. Factor A, at times it's impossible to discern one coherent motivation and thus stamp the characters with just, with just one simple seal. An example, I spent a number of years researching white immigrants in German service. The question is, uh, there is like what? 20 plus thousand people tops. And at the same time, it's a small topic, but it's futile to approach it, to approach these men if you're armed only with the dichotomy of patriotism versus high treason or patriotism versus betrayal. Meaning, dualistic, simple answers do not fit the bill. Factor B, what we think we know about the collaboration in the USSR does not necessarily stand the test of time. Vlasov was not the only big boss among the Soviet citizens recruited for German service. Well, I'm sure you all know or heard at least about the uh, Bronislav Kaminsky case. Igor Petrov and yours truly have been looking into the topic of Corona, the Russian uh, Liberation People's Army, for some time now. For two decades, Russian historians have been chewing on the same timeline, repeating the same trope, and no one cared to look at the documents 
be a mom that have helped to cure convince cancer people up. And it turns out that the inception of the whole phenomenon of the local autonomy, the actions of Kaminsky on the ground, the process of organization, of vetting their organization and his units were different. Trying to bridge similar gaps in the last of Army's history, Agar and I are now finalizing an accessible book about the raw. So what does it all mean? The topic of collaboration is definitely shedding the uh, dead skin of approved truths and cozy half-truths. And that would the rewriting of history is long overdue in this sense. Although for some, the term rewriting itself might sound like a blasphemous curse. In fact, this is what every historian's job description reads like. We unearth new data, we slice open the pockets of knowledge, then we interpret and reinterpret the past, effectively recalibrating it. Then a new image of it emerges, an image that is multi-layered, problematic, and yes, contentious. But the past is never simple. Thankfully, though, it will forever remain in our rear view mirrors. Thank you so much, Oleg, for your uh, comments. We now have about 25 minutes for discussion, which I think it's a, it's a good amount of time. So I thank everybody for having kind of collecting the, the time. I would like first to invite uh, uh, speakers to discuss between themselves if there are questions or comments, if you would like to reply to each other, I would invite you to take the floor and the same for Andre, who is on the phone. If there are some questions to each other, I would invite you to that we begin with that. Would there be some comments? Uh, I'll just have a question for Oleg about the Lokot and Kaminsky work. Um, you know, there were a number of people who traveled from different parts of the occupied territories to Lokot, and I wonder if you, in, in, I alluded to these discussions about, you know, some sort of uh, concession to Russian national sentiment or projects within the occupied territories, if you've ever come across anything in that regard, and well, are you talking about? Interest. Are you talking about the emissaries to lock it, like like red? Yes, weekend? exactly, exactly. And I think it would be interesting for people to hear more broadly who are not familiar with the local uh, sama upravlenia or the autonomous region. That could be very interesting to say a few words about. Right. Okay. Um, well, basically, uh, there there was such a thing as uh, lock it. Administration Lokot is in the Bransk region, which is uh, what is it, North northwestern Russia. Um, the the story goes that the there was some sort of a, like an anti-partisan republic, and there was this guy Bronislav Kaminsky that had uh, he was like a local tsar, and Germans only were well, you know, producing some sort of uh, bedding and 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 basically gave him some sort of weapons, and and, and after that he had a like free hand policy. And so many people allude that uh, he had this autonomous region, supposedly autonomous, uh, and and his only task was to uh, you know conduct anti-partisan operations and, and uh, get resources and, and ship and ship it over. Um, the uh, problem with this whole story, is, and and it's not just you know the heat or everything. Uh, it's also that uh, there is a very limited, as I said, grasp on on the document. So. Many for many many decades, uh, those historians that were writing about it, they they said that uh, uh, the Germans just uh, well, they just said yes to what the, the Soviets zipped out right October forty one. Then there was like sort of a lull, and 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 and, in the, and during this time, uh, local units started forming forming themselves. There was like another boss before Kaminsky, boss Kaboynik. Uh, he got killed in January forty two, and Kaminsky took over. Uh, and the Germans supposedly just said said yes to when when they when they occupied the territories they just said yes to what had been formed on the ground what the, what they uh, what they what they were facing. But the reality was different. If we look at the German documents for months, months, the second um, the second part of the army that was conducting the occupation in the region, they didn't even know that such a thing, some sort of autonomy exists uh, in, the, in their immediate rear. 
they started looking into the into the issue only in, in February 1942. So what I mean is October 41, February 42, there's at least a few months when um, there was very little con control uh, exercised over what was happening in terms of anti-partisan warfare. And uh, this is just one big example. This is a, this is a big topic, right? Kaminsky was fighting for the Germans uh, when Vlasov was a, a perfect Red Army high-ranking officer. Uh, if we know so little about such big topics, how can we make uh, sweeping conclusions about uh, even bigger topics such as war? That was a very long answer to a very short question, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Oleg. Uh, there is a question for both um, Michael and Sergei about the local level of archives. So how do we do research at the local level? I mean, the Vlasov archive that we have been translating here are mostly uh, uh, kind of federal archives or, or, or archives coming from other European countries. How does it work at the local level? and how, it, uh, how can we try to assess the different ways, different localities reacted to a, a Nazi occupation? Smolensk is uh, an interesting case. There have been research done by uh, Boris Kovalyov on Novgorod. How do we work on this kind of local access in terms of, of doing research, but also trying to conceptualize what it was on the ground at the local level? So if Michael or Sergey would like to comment on that aspect. I'm happy to go first if Sergey would, would, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to defer to Sergey. Um, go first, uh, yeah. Michael. Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, for me, it, de it depends on the region, right? Because for me in Smolensk, I had many colleagues. The archives uh, were extremely helpful. So, you know, but other people in other regions have had different experiences, but I th think you see a different level of documentation. Sergei, for example, edited an extremely valuable um, volume of documents on the partisan movement from Kremlin archives. Those give you a central point of view, but some, you have to sift through a lot of junk, but when you get a lower level, and I think all regional historians know this, and local historians, you get uh, things closer to events and you often get extremely interesting documents, no less important than the ones sitting in the Kremlin sometimes. But what I think is that a lot of local and regional historians, and you see this um, in other areas like people working on Bryansk and uh, Leningrad Oblast, and they've produced extremely interesting work, but it's very limited to the, it sort of becomes what the Russians call Kraya Vigenya, you know, sort of localist studies. And if you don't include incorporation of bigger forces, say so you're getting a slice at the local level or the middle level, but you're not getting necessarily studying the German sources. The number of people who study both German and Russian Soviet documents is shockingly low, uh, even today when people know both languages. So, you know, that's the problem of including an element of the so Moscow and Berlin, home front occupied territories, and then incorporating your regional and local material into a bigger narrative. For me, that's that's the biggest challenge. Sergey, would you like to add something on that? Yes. Well, I, I think, and as far as I know, uh, all local archives in Russia are open. Uh, they belong to the state and they, uh, I mean, you just go and do your own research. The problem is that sometimes, uh, or to be honest, quite often, uh, finding aids are not good enough. And you need a lot of time to understand what actually collections you have in, in, in a particular archive. And archivists themselves, though they are very often very helpful, um, do not know much about German occupation. They, not many people speak German or read German, and uh, often they do not realize that they've got real important stuff in their hands. For instance, in the local archive of Taganrog, 
there are files of Einsatz Group at being responsible for a big area of, of, of southern Russia. And as you know, uh, leaders of uh, Einsatzgruppen uh, were responsible for local administration. They dealt with major collaboration figures and so on. And uh, those uh, entirely unknown documents might change our attitudes to, to, to many events. Uh, but uh, uh, this is really a future, if you like, a future research uh, when you go region by region to provide a more general picture. The picture is complicated, of course, but uh, I mean, France was also a complicated matter. Belgium as well. What about Denmark, folks? What about Norway? I mean, I think Russia is very similar to Europe in this sense. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. We have a question asking for more details about the role of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad in the creation and support of the Vlasov Army. We have these famous photos of Vlasov in 1944, I think, at the Prague Congress, receiving some of the uh, um, bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad. So do we know about research going on on that question of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad? role in, in the collaboration, especially in uh, supporting Vlasov? It's an open question to everybody on the panel. Well, there's only a few historians, well, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, approach the topic of religious collaboration. One of them is Konstantin Obozny, but he writes in Russian only, as far as I know. And uh, before him, there was, well, I think he's still alive, Mikhail Shkarovsky. Uh, he researched uh, the topic of Orthodox Christianity and uh, NS occupation, but I don't think that there is anything, you know, specifically, particularly done on this little subtopic of uh, Orthodox Christianity plus Vlasov. Mm -hmm. Tatiana, as you worked on the archives, did you see anything interesting that it could be some documents we didn't publish or translate? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, as for the um, Russian Orthodox uh, Orthodox Church abroad, they it was the time at the end of 1944, beginning of the 1945, when the, this uh, Russian Church abroad had, um, let me say, give a big help to blast of. Um, they they organized some meeting, they some uh, church uh, <coughs> service for the blast of army, for the soldiers, for the officers. So, for example, it's uh, the Christmas time, uh, Russian Christmas, with some, for example, with some kind of uh, small small presents from the church to soldiers. That means. Uh, uh, it was uh, some kind of uh, understanding from Blasov and some kind of on the other side from the Russian church. And as wide right as I know, there is uh, some archive in San Francisco, different okay? <laughs> in the west of um, USA, uh, where the, the Russian uh, Orthodox Church abroad uh, has collected have collected the documents of uh, of some uh, some connection between uh, uh, between Vlasovites uh, and also the people who after Second World War were the members of Roa and then uh, they came to USA, but uh, they held hold this connection for a long long time. It means the Russian church abroad. And uh, yeah, I know that it's possible to work at this archive. And maybe when someone uh, put a question, this question, what, what kind of connection it was, it's possible to make the research at this archive. Thank you. There is another question asking about the fate of all those who collaborated and who could escape 
either to the US or to Latin America. And the question is asking about the, the access to Soviet documents on tracking those who escaped to the US or to Latin America. What is the, the, the research? Do we have research going on, on on looking at the Soviet archive on trying to track trace those who, who left? And Benjamin, you worked on uh, uh, several of them in, in the US uh, uh, side, but what about Latin America, for, for example? Uh, I, I think that's work that still really needs to be done. Um, uh, I, I worked a lot with the Stasi documents in, in the East German intelligence and established that there was clearly a very close tracking of these people, but I, I, I think that that's work that, that is still, uh, uh, and certainly the, the geographical scope of, uh, of the Russian diaspora makes it a very difficult uh, topic. So. Yeah, and Tatiana or Sergey, anything about Soviet document trying to track those who left to the US or to Latin America? Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, well, I mean, as far as uh, the archive of the Federal Security Services is concerned, uh, uh, it is, uh, it belongs to, it, it doesn't belong to a federal system of archives, so, and uh, there is no free access to, to, to those files. But as far as we know, uh, unfortunately, a great deal of files were destroyed um, at the end of 80s, beginning of 90s. Uh, quite often, if they could not pursue a particular figure somewhere, if they had no information, his personal file could be destroyed. Or if, if he or she died, the file could also be destroyed. But what is interesting that up to the last days of the Soviet Union, KGB informed, as we say now, Western partners and other governments about Nazi collaborators living on, uh, in their countries. So and th that information might be available uh, in the archives of the CIA or, or, or any other institutions. But this subject needs to be researched. I mean, it, it's definitely a major issue for future historiography. Can I add one thing? Of course. Um, it's very hard to say, to sort of come up with a blanket uh, decision or a blanket conclusion for what happened to those guys that went elsewhere. It doesn't even matter if it's Latin America, France, Western Germany. Uh, generally, you have to go with a uh, uh, Deal with the uh, would deal with it uh, case by case. But for example, there is a new archival database. It's online. It's available. But Arolsen. Um, so if if you're really into research and you know at least the uh, surname of your character, or maybe he used a pen name, you can track track quite a bit. And uh, yours truly and Igor Petrov, we actually did that, and we did find out what happened to some of our characters. Where's the where's where there is a will there's there is a way I guess. <laughs> Thank <Sometimes>. you. <laughs> Sometimes there is another question more about the interpretation of the the Vlasov cases thing that Benjamin was mentioning on how the narrative elaborated by white emigre during Cold War period re-enter uh, uh, Russia and so the question is uh, how about about how do we trace how this kind of pro Vlasov narrative re-enter Russia. Uh, um, uh, Sergei mentioned uh, the, the Gavril Popov case, but there have been several other uh, Russian figures who have been pushing for a kind of presenting Vlasov as a, a, a hero of, of Russian national identity. So how do we trace uh, uh, that, how this narrative re-enter uh, uh, late Soviet Union or post-Soviet Russia, or maybe it was still there somewhere in the underground on the Soviet side? So that's also a question open to, to the whole panel. Benjamin, would you uh, like to begin? Yes. Sure, just just briefly. I, I mean, I think, that, again, this is research that has to be done. Uh, but if we, a, a figure who hasn't been mentioned in today's discussion by name, Kirill Alexandrov, we know that uh, he he went to, to, to uh, Germany uh, during the end of the, or right after I passed the end of the Soviet Union and became involved in the NTS. Uh, 
met Hoffman, uh, right, who's a, who had written the important uh, German narrative. So I think we just have to trace these uh, the 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 the, the uh, Russian, and of course these people are alive, and it, these are part of a discussion, and we need to uh, we need to trace the flow of ideas. Um, and, and I'm hoping that I think that there will be many interesting stories to discover in that regard. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on that question? If not, then then I would like to give the floor to Andre, who wanted to uh, make a comment. Andre, can you join us on the phone? Matt, can we have Andre on the phone? He's unmuted if you'd like to join. No. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, a short uh, comment, uh, Marlene. You raised uh, an interesting uh, problem about uh, Russian Orthodox Church, uh, the occupied uh, territory. I want uh, to say only one thing. Uh, that uh, we uh, realize uh, just now uh, multi-volume uh, uh, project uh, of the publication of uh, the documents uh, entitled uh, Confessional, uh, Confessional uh, Politics of the Soviet uh, States. Uh, and the uh, first uh, four volumes uh, were uh, published uh, in previous year and just now uh, is ready uh, a few books uh, devoted uh, to the period of uh, Second World War. And by the way, uh, a year ago uh, was uh, printed uh, the special collection of documents devoted uh, to the uh, Russian uh, Orthodox Church uh, in Ukraine during uh, Second World War. So uh, we know uh, about uh, this problem. We know a lot of many facts uh, and we have uh, a lot of many documents uh, about uh, all these uh, issues uh, and uh, let's think about uh, how to work uh, on this topic uh, uh, how to promote maybe projects uh, co-joint projects uh, in this sphere uh, because uh, it's really very interesting uh, uh, problem. Uh, so uh, my idea is uh, to think uh, how uh, we may cooperate uh, on such uh, projects uh, uh, such as uh, General Lhasa for like this because uh, I am sure that uh, such difficult uh, pages uh they are interesting uh, not uh, only for historians but first of all uh, for public for mass uh, consciousness and uh, to my mind we have all opportunities uh, to construct uh, some uh, interesting uh, uh, projects uh, seminars uh, conferences uh, in this sphere let's think about this well, thank you very much, Andre. Happy to know that there will be soon a publication on this confessional uh, uh, politics during during the war. And I'm pretty sure that for those who cannot read uh, uh, in Russian, having a, an English translation would just be uh, fascinating also to compare with with Vatican collaboration times and, and, and so on. Last question, I think, because we have only a few minutes left and that's specifically uh, uh, to Michael, but I think that's one of the kind of underlying question about the 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 interpretation of the vlasov case is that how can we try to calculate the proportion of soviet collaborationists who really had a political motivation 
compared to those who were just, you know, acting in an opportunistic uh, uh, way. So how can we try to measure the level of, of political motivation that uh, those who collaborate in can have? And here again, it's an open question. I know the answer is not easy. And once again, the answer will not be anything specific. Soviet, I think it's the same question we have for <laughs> the countries who collaborated globally, I know myself from France, it's one of the, the big questions also. So, Michael, some few words on that aspect, please. Just very briefly, this is the <laughs> Sphinx riddle of Soviet history in general. What did people really think? It's almost impossible. But I would just say one thing is that you can't really disaggregate political belief ideology from all the other factors. Just think about your own life. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do this for political reasons. It's a mixture, and it's always a different mixture. There's a book edited by Alyed Budnitsky called Ideeni Collaborationism, Ideological Collaborationism, which collects memoirs in which the ideological factor is prominent. The ideology in question was not fascism or Nazism, it was anti-Stalinism. So I think that's the more general proposition. A second point is that actions speak louder than words sometimes. What people did rather than they, what they said later on about their motivations. For example, the case of Menshagen that I mentioned, you can trace his movements during the evacuation of 1941. And it's been very convincingly shown in the book that I mentioned by a, a, a Smolensk colleague that he made a conscious decision not to evacuate, but to, to remain. And that decision set him down a path which was irreversible. So these are complicated questions, but I would say again, poli political belief on some sort of level is very prominent, but as the dominant factor, very few probably. Thank you so much for this, uh, I think, good conclusion. And I would like, so it's already uh, uh, 4.30 here, I mean, here in the US, and it will be 10.30, uh, sorry, here in the US, it will be time for us to conclude, I would like to thank our uh, three discussants who have been talking from uh, uh, Seattle, Australia, and uh, Washington, D.C., and thanks to our three Russian speakers representing the archive once again. Thank you to the Russian archives for helping us doing this, uh, uh, working on all these uh, documents, making, allowing historians to access all these really important uh, uh, documents and thank you to our three discussants for bringing all their research and, and field work into that discussion and I hope we will be continuing uh, uh, having similar seminars looking at some other aspect of that question. So thank you everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>